All right, everyone, let's get started. I'm just going to throw the video on for a second so you can see who's talking at you. Um, so my name is Jessica Wolf, and I am the Urban Wildlife Coordinator for the Western Region um, for, this, for the state, um, not a Department of Wildlife. And we are here today to just do some awesome education programs. We miss talking to everyone in our communities. Um, so we wanted to find a way that we could still do some of our programs, get some education out there and connect with all of you. I know most of us are working at home or uh, social distancing at home. So this is a great opportunity um, to learn a little bit and all of that good stuff. So keeping that in mind, um, this is a PG rated uh, show today. So if you have any, any inappropriate comments or anything like that, um, you can and will be um, removed. I have an awesome moderator here. Her name is Jessica Height, and she'll be on the question and answer little key, um, responding to any of your questions and here to pipe in if she has anything else to add. Um, so with that, if you do have any questions, make sure to fill out that question and answer little button. Um, and if there's anything that we don't get to, I'll put my contact information at the very end. So you can always shoot me over an email, give me a call, whatever you need, I'm here for you. Uh, and this is our very first ever um, webinar, so if it gets a little hairy, I'm sorry. It's our first one and we're practicing. Um, so like I said, we are going to talk about the wonderful world of coyotes, so I'm going to stop my video here. Um, but the first thing that I would love everyone to do is to kind of think back to a time when you first saw a coyote. What were your thoughts and your feelings? Um, how, how did that feel? And keeping those kind of thoughts and feelings in mind, just making sure we're aware of all of our biases. I remember the very first time I ever saw a coyote, I was probably about 10 years old and up in my mom's room. And I knew there were coyotes behind my house, but I didn't know a lot about them. And I saw one running in a field that was filled with lots of sagebrush. And I have to admit, I was pretty scared when I was that age, um, but I've grown to totally love and appreciate them for all of the good work that they help us to do. All right. Click. There we go. So first we're gonna start and talk about all the canids that we have in the United States. Um, so a canid is basically an animal that is in the dog family. Um, in the United States, there are gray wolves, coyotes, red foxes, gray foxes, and the adorable little kit fox. In um, Nevada, we do not have an established population of gray wolf, uh, but we do have the coyote, the red fox, which is very, very rare, uh, the gray fox, as well as the kit. So we don't have any established populations of wolves in Nevada. Um, the last confirmed sighting that we had was back in 2016, and that was up near Fox Mountain, kind of up by the Black Rock Desert and Gerlach. Um, and it was just here for a little bit, and we confirmed it because someone actually took a video of it, and there was some scat that we sent off to the University of Idaho, I believe, and they were able to confirm that it was a gray wolf. But other than that, super, super rare that they're ever in our state. But we do receive a lot of reports of people saying, I saw a wolf, I saw a wolf. Uh, but there are some pretty big differences between a wolf and a coyote. Um, first main one is the size. A gray wolf can be anywhere from 80 to 120 pounds, whereas our coyote friends are gonna be anywhere from 20 to 50 pounds. And typically ours are kind of in the middle there. Uh, the gray wolf has those beautiful round, rounded ears and a broad snout, whereas the coyote has tall pointed ears, all the better to hear you with, and a long kind of narrowed snout. If you're interested, um, shoot me over an email after this and the uh, Oregon fishing game, they actually have a quiz that you can take to see if you can identify a gray wolf from a coyote. It's pretty fun. So what do our coyotes look like? Um, most of our coyotes are a brownish gray color with cream colored bellies. Again, they're gonna have those stiff 
pointed ears with that slender muzzle. And they have a bushy tail with a black tip. And then if you look at this top picture of the coyote, you can also kind of see all of their guard hairs on their back and everything. They're also kind of tipped in black. They have those really long, uh, long and slender model legs, I like to call them. And that makes them look a lot bigger than they are. But a coyote is only going to usually weigh anywhere from 20 to 50 pounds. To put that in kind of perspective, an English Cocker Spaniel weighs about 28 to 34 pounds. Um, so they're about the size of a medium-sized dog and, and they look a lot larger than they, than they actually are. Um, in the wild, they will live anywhere from six to eight years. Um, so that's kind of their, their lifespan. And you can see down here kind of a, a nice view of how big a coyote is compared to a Labrador Retriever, which I'm sure some of us have a fox, and then a domestic cat. So coyotes are amazing critters. Um, they kind of started off in North America in the middle of uh, the States. Um, so pre-1700s, that's where they were hanging out. Um, but when humans came over and we started to remove grizzly bears and wolves, which were some of their, their predators and competitors in the plains and everything, they slowly started to move out west, out east, um, north, and south. So now they can be found um, in every state and down to South America and up into Canada. So they're, they're really amazing at adapting. Um, the last estimate was that we had just over 100,000 in the state of Nevada. And they can be found in a lot of our major cities, if not all of them, um, because they're so good at living near humans and they're also really good at getting around. So they're really good swimmers. Um, they've been found in Central Park before. They have a pretty big population in Chicago. They're kind of all over the place and in our cities, even if we don't really notice that they're there. And they have some amazing adaptations. Coyotes have many more awesome adaptations than these four, um, but these are the ones that I think make them so awesome. So their first one are their vocalizations. So they use these vocalizations in order to communicate with their pack members. So if you have a dog around, I'm gonna play a sound of a coyote and yesterday my dog was not very happy about it. So just be warned. But this is kind of a quintessential coyote yippee howl. I'm sure that sounds pretty familiar to most of us, especially living in Nevada. I know I hear them all of the time. Um, and because of those sounds, they are known as the song dogs. Uh, one study found that humans really aren't good at determining the number of coyotes just based off of vocalizations. Um, typically, we overestimate how many coyotes are in the area um, just based off of sound. So if there are five hanging out, we might think that there are 20. We are not very good at um, knowing what they're talking about. Uh, but like I said, they do use those communications in order to um, talk with their pack members. One common misconception is that coyotes will howl and announce when they've made um, captured a uh, prey item. But this doesn't really make a lot of sense for them to survive, right? If you're announcing to the whole world, hey, I just got an awesome rabbit. What's up? you're gonna invite other animals to come into that area and check what's going on and try and get that food item. So they don't announce um, that they've, they've made a kill, uh, but they do use that to tell other pack members, hey, maybe there's an intruder or just communicate with them that way. They're also very adaptable to a lot of different habitats. Um, so if you see at the bottom, these are just a couple of the habitats that we have in Nevada. Um, so we've got the desert, the forest up in Lake Tahoe. We have the city of Las Vegas, which makes awesome habitat for coyotes. 
and then to some plain areas um, where there's maybe some more grasses. And they can live in all of these different places. In fact, they do super, super well um, when, they, when it comes to living near humans because of some of these adaptations. And we unintentionally invite them into our spaces. Um, they also have really flexible behavior. So coyotes in the wild, they'll be um, awake and active during the day, during the night, really whenever, but they, they are more active during the day. Whereas our urban coyotes, they have learned to be more active at nighttime. That's a great adaptation for them because it basically helps them to avoid humans. That doesn't mean that they're always gonna be nocturnal and only um, active during dawn and dusk, but they definitely tend to lean more that way when they're near urban environments. They're also omnivores. Um, if you look at a coyote's teeth, technically they are considered to be carnivores, but their diet is very omnivorous, just like us. They're gonna be eating plants, animals, carry on, anything that they can really get their paws on, they're going to eat. Um, and they're very opportunistic. So if there's an easy meal, they will go after that meal and eat it. So the family life of coyotes. They are typically going to live in packs. Um, there are some cases when they do not. So if they're old and sick, sometimes they're kicked out of a pack or if they are um, male coyotes that were kicked out, they'll be on their own. But typically they're going to live in a pack structure. The packs are run by an alpha male and an alpha female. And those are the only two that really reproduce. Everyone else is there for territory defense and making sure that um, all is good in their little territory. The alpha male and the alpha female are gonna be monogamous. So they're gonna stay with the same coyote throughout their lifetime. And um, the other members of the pack are puppies from pack litters or coyotes that have been adopted into the family life. Typically rural packs are smaller than urban packs just because urban areas give coyotes so much more food resources that they can take advantage of. So they're a little bit larger um, in city areas like Las Vegas and Reno than they would be in the middle of the desert. So here's a little brief history of what our coyotes um, look like throughout the year. So January through February is their mating season. That's when the alpha male and the alpha female are gonna get ready to have their pups. Um, in March and April, they select their den site. This is typically when they get a little bit more territorial. Um, they don't want any other animals to come into that area to maybe take those resources from them. And there can be uh, more frequent sightings during this time period. Then from April to August, that is the pup season. They're more active hunting um, and they're, they have anywhere from four to seven pups. What's cool about coyotes is they'll actually um, base how many puppies they have on the food resources. So if it's a really healthy year, there's lots of rabbits, lots of squirrels, voles, food for them to eat, they're going to have more puppies. If there isn't as many food resources for them, they'll typically have less. And then finally, in September and December, some of the puppies will disperse. Coyotes are almost full grown at nine months old. Um, so they'll either be kicked out or some of them will stay and help with the whole new cycle of protecting those resources um, for the new puppies that'll be born that April. Coyotes are really helpful to humans um, and in ways that might surprise you. So they are a keystone species. What that means is a bunch of other species actually rely on coyotes for the health of the ecosystem. And if coyotes weren't in that ecosystem, uh, it could potentially collapse. So take rabbits, for instance. Coyotes kind of help to regulate um, the population of rabbits. If there weren't any coyotes, what do you think would happen to the rabbit population? it'd probably go up pretty dramatically, um, which would affect all the other species within that ecosystem. So they're really, really important in keeping all of those small mammals 
and birds um, populations in check and healthy. They also help us with rodent control. I've had mice in my house, it's not super fun, but our coyotes help us to manage those levels to make sure that there's not um, a huge increase in those populations. This is also super important um, because a lot of rodents uh, will carry diseases like hantavirus or plague. So having those coyotes around, kind of managing those levels, making sure they don't get out of hand also helps to ensure that um, those diseases don't affect humans as much. And then they're also the ultimate house cleaners. Like I said before, they will eat carry-on. So whether that be off the side of the road or off on our hiking trails, if there's an animal that has been killed by a car or just died of natural causes, they're gonna help to clean all of that up and make sure um, that our spaces stay wonderful and continue that awesome cycle. So conflicts with humans are extremely rare. Even though they seem very, very scary, um, coyotes really don't pose a threat to humans. In the state of Nevada, there has never been a fatal attack on a human, um, whereas each year, 20 to 30 people die from our domestic dogs. Um, so they're more dangerous than, than the coyote. And if we take the proper uh, precautions and we kind of teach our coyote populations how to be quote unquote good neighbors, we can definitely learn to coexist with them so that they can help us out with all of our rodent control and help keep all the ecosystems healthy um, while living in our backyard. So a lot of the time um, being in urban wildlife, I get questions of why can't you remove the coyotes? Why can't you relocate the coyotes? Why can't you um, lethally remove the coyotes? And there's quite a few reasons why removal really doesn't solve any of the problem. Um, so first we'll go into lethal removal. So like we were kind of talking about, coyotes um, have an alpha male and an alpha female. They're monogamous. They're going to be the only two who reproduce. However, when you cull some of those coyotes and one of the alphas, um, the whole pack structure goes a little haywire. So at first, you will definitely have a decrease in coyotes in the area. However, other coyotes will come into the area and start mating with the coyotes that are still there, and they all start having puppies. So it's going to increase the population um, in, in that habitat. Then with um, Relocation, that also is not a very good option for, for managing coyotes. Uh, the reason, one reason, pretty expensive and it's not a long-term solution. So by removing the coyotes and maybe moving them somewhere else, all you're doing is opening up a place in that habitat where there's good habitat because there were coyotes already there and it's just inviting other animals and other coyotes to come into the area and inhabit that. So really, again, it's not going to be a long-term solution. Um, the best long-term solution is to really learn how to live with the coyotes that you have in your area and help to prevent conflicts with them. So now we're going to get into my bread and butter, how to prevent conflicts with coyotes, um, whether that be at your house or um, when you're out on a trail. So first, it's important to think like a coyote. What might be attracting them to an area? So all animals, including humans, we need four things in order to survive. The first four are food, water, shelter, and the last one is space. If we were to put you or me in a really tiny box and told to survive that way, we would not survive, right? So a coyote needs plenty of space, just like us, and then food, water, and shelter. And our backyards, provide lots of these opportunities, um, whether we know it or not. Bird seed, who would have thought that would attract a coyote, right? So we all love looking at, at birds and feeding them, which is awesome, but feeding those birds is not only going to attract birds to your yard, but the fallen bird seed can attract rodents, and both rodents and birds are on a coyote's menu, and they will also eat the bird seed. 
So having a bird feeder can actually lead a coyote to kind of come into your yard and decide that there's an awesome abundance of food, so why not hang out for a while? Pet food is another huge attractant for coyotes. Um, if you feed your pets outside, they're gonna have those bowls. If the, the dog or the cat doesn't finish all of their food, there's leftover food. There's even just the smell of the bowl with all of that deliciousness in there that it will attract a coyote and other animals like raccoons and skunks into your yard. Trash is another big attractant. Coyotes are omnivores, so they're eating just about anything and they'll go into our trash and pull out some of those delicious treats like that leftover pizza that you didn't quite get, quite get to eating. They'll eat that up. Water features are a big one as well. So living in Nevada, we live in one of the driest states in the nation and water is a very precious resource. And while I too love listening to all the little trickles of water from our fountains, that's going to attract animals into the area, whether it be the coyote for the water or the coyote for all the other animals that are attracted to that water source. Fallen fruit is another big one. Um, they'll not only eat these delicious red apples, but they'll all, the apples will also attract rodents again and birds and things, other things that the coyote can eat. And finally, backyard pets and livestock are a huge attractant. So right here, we have a little backyard ch chicken coop, but does this chicken coop look coyote proof? Not so much, right? Um, so the chickens are out in the open. They're only protected with chicken wire um, and chicken wire really doesn't do a good job of protecting chickens from predators. Um, it's really meant to keep chickens in and not predators out. It also isn't fully enclosed. A coyote could easily jump over that fence. Coyotes can jump over a seven foot fence pretty easily. Um, so if a coyote were to come in here, grab one of those delicious looking chickens and be off, they'll probably be back because they knew that they got a positive food reward, the chicken, and no negative consequences. They were able to get in, get out, and nothing bad happened. And if you're an animal trying to survive in the world, you're gonna go with the easiest route possible in order to get yourself fed. With all of that being said, um, the likelihood of a domestic pet being preyed on by a coyote is relatively low, especially if you take the next few steps that we'll go over. Um, but this study done in 2006 was done in Chicago, and it looked at the scat of um, urban coyotes in the area. And domestic cat only made up 1% of all of the scat that they um, originally looked at. And that was about 1,400 samples of scat um, of those coyotes. So just keep that in mind. Here's a few pictures of coyotes doing what coyotes do and exploiting the resources that are out there and available to them. Um, so you can kind of see all of these are kind of in desert areas. They're getting the water sources from bird baths, from fountains, uh, bird seed, and a delicious sweet treat from that hummingbird feeder over there. So everyone just take a minute um, and kind of think to your yard right now. Are there things that you think might attract a coyote to your area? Um, and if it's not in your yard, do you think that there's anything in your neighbor's yard that might be attracting coyotes and inviting them into your space? And if anyone wants to share, throw it in that, that question and answer little bucket. Any thoughts on things that might uh, attract a coyote that you, maybe we didn't go over? It's totally cool if you don't. Yeah, water fountain and bird feeder, definitely. Perfect, all right.
So this is uh, another study that I believe is currently happening right now in um, Rhode Island. And it just shows how much good can be done by removing those food sources from an area. So this um, is data from two coyotes that were fitted with GPS collars. And it shows where they're traveling. And you can kind of see they're hanging out in the same kind of neighborhood, right? So the researchers and um, authorities went out there and they gave a warning and told the people in this neighborhood, hey, you have to remove all of these attractants that are attracting coyotes into your area. So this original tracking period was from May 4th to May 17th in 2019. And when they removed all of those attractants, the coyotes stopped coming into that neighborhood entirely because they were not getting that positive food reward. They weren't getting, um, getting the food that they wanted. Uh, so their visiting of that neighborhood dropped dramatically. I think it's a great illustration to show just how much food uh, really attracts animals into our neighborhoods. So with that, when you're trying to look at your property and find ways to make it so that coyotes don't wanna be in the area, the first thing is first is to remove those attractants, make it so that those animals cannot get to those food or water resources or shelter places to shelter. Um, so you can do this by removing excess shrubs, making sure all of your fallen fruit is picked up, um, making sure that if you are feeding birds, you can break up all of the fallen bird seeds so it's not gonna attract rodents into the area. Really just being vigilant on what you have in your area and making sure that um, an animal can't access it. Then on top of that, you can install motion sensor um, activated devices in order to try and scare away the coyotes. Um, so there are motion sensor lights, which the caveat to that is coyotes can become habituated, which basically means just really used to a motion sensor light, especially urban coyotes where they're kind of used to light anyways. Um, so that doesn't always work, but it will definitely alert you that there's something in your yard. Motion sensor sprinklers are an awesome tool. So this right here is a motion sensor sprinkler. Basically, it notices motion in the area, sprays water to that. I have not met many animals, myself included, that like to be sprayed with water when they're not expecting it. So it's a great way to kind of deter the animals from wanting to be in the area. There's also motion sensor noisemakers, but again, caveat with that, you don't wanna make your neighbors too angry. Um, making sure that you have a fully fenced yard is gonna be important. Um, a six foot fence is great, but again, coyotes can still jump over a seven foot fence. So there are devices you can add on top of that called coyote rollers. And if you look down here, you can kind of see an example of how those rollers work. Basically, they sit on top of the fence and when a coyote tries to jump up, they can't get a grip on top of that fence and it pushes them back onto, quote unquote, their side of, of the property. And then you never want to allow a coyote to become um, comfortable in your yard. So if you ever see one there, you always wanna make sure that you are scaring it away to the best of your ability. So with your pets, um, Pets are kind of a tricky subject, right? A coyote cannot differentiate between a small dog and a rabbit or a cat and a rabbit, right? They don't know that that's a, a human pet and that's not something that they can go after. It would be like if I put chocolate in all of your houses and maybe it wasn't meant for you, maybe it was. A coyote doesn't differentiate. So it's really important to always supervise your dog whenever it's outside. Um, to make sure that no conflicts occur. Does this picture look familiar to anyone? I know it certainly does for me. My dog loves to pull on the leash, um, but if there was a coyote out there and she was off leash, my silly dog would want to go up to it and think that it's friends. But coyotes don't speak good dog and dogs don't speak good coyote, and that's just gonna end in conflict. So we always wanna, whenever we're outside, keep our dogs on a six foot leash, because this is really the only way um, that you as a dog parent have full control over the situation. 
and then you never want to allow your dog to interact with coyotes. So if you look down at this picture, you can see a beautiful pupper chasing a coyote, which is not ever going to be a good thing because that coyote is probably really scared and it's going to go back to its pack where it feels safe and a conflict can occur because they're trying to defend their territory from an outsider. So really making sure that you always have control over your pet and never allowing your dog to interact with coyotes is going to be very, very important. With cats, the only way to keep a cat protected is to really keep it inside. Um, so you can invest in things like catios. Those are like this right here. So it's a fully enclosed area where a cat can still roam. It has a roof so nothing can get in and it can't get out. Um, this is good not only for your cats because cats can um, transmit diseases to other animals like bobcats and vice versa. It's also going to protect a lot of wildlife. Um, cats outside cats are known to kill about 2 billion birds every single year. Um, so keeping them inside protects not only them, but also other wildlife in the area. And then if you do want to leave your dog outside unattended, um, making sure that it's in a fully enclosed dog run with a roof is um, a, a good option. So then you have peace of mind that your dog isn't going to get into trouble um, and everything is protected. So this right here is a great option. Sorry, it's a little blurry, but it's for a smaller dog. Um, and I thought it was interesting because I had never seen anything like this before where it's so close down to the ground. Um, but you can, of course, do a big dog run with a, a roof and it's six foot tall and all of that. So with your livestock, um, keeping small livestock in fully enclosed pens um, with a roof is going to be the best option um, for chickens and rabbits. I know in Reno where I'm located, um, lots of people have backyard chickens, which is great. I love me some farm fresh eggs. Um, but again, like that original picture, a coyote is going to love that just as much. So making sure your chickens are in a fully enclosed run is going to be really important. You also want to make sure that you're not using chicken wire um, and using hard cloth. About a quarter inch hard cloth um, is going to be really effective in trying to keep predators out. And coyotes are by no means the only animal that will go after chickens. You've got skunks, raccoons, owls, bobcats, you name it. A backyard chicken is a great meal for them. So they're, they're going to go after those as well. This little chicken coop right here also has the um, advantage of not being directly on the ground, so nothing can dig under it. Um, definitely a good suggestion. You can also make a little apron underneath the ground and face it out in the shape of an L um, so that if any animal tries to dig down or in, they're going to hit that hard um, metal and they won't be able to get into the coop. So really trying to think like a predator how would a predator get into whatever space you're trying to protect is going to help you out. You can also use electric fencing around livestock. I have a, a study that kind of went over um, the best type of fencing to use. If that's something that anyone's interested in, feel free to let me know and I can get that to you. Um, but ultimately, they suggested modified woven wire fences that are anywhere from four to four and a half feet high. Um, Again, this is something that you will have to upkeep if it's something that you want to use and always make sure that it's working properly. And then you can always invest in some guardian animals. This right here is Bear. He is a great Pyrenees um, and he does a very good protect. And then there's llamas and donkeys and lots of other animals that make for great um, livestock guardians. So on a hike or a walk, you always want to look and read any signs on the trail. I know that there are some places that will announce and kind of say, hey, coyote sightings in the area, um, give some tips and things like that. You want to hike um, or walk during the midday. That's when most animals are going to be less active. Always pay attention for tracks and scat. Um, and then again, always have your dog on a leash. And if you see a coyote in an area that is um, frequented by humans, you always want to haze it away. And we'll get into what that means in a second. 
But if you look at this picture over here, you can see the gentleman has his dog on a leash. And then he also has a little slingshot right there that he's using to kind of haze away the coyote. So if he wasn't trying to haze that coyote away, what message do you think that coyote would get by being that close to you, human? Probably that they can do it whenever they want to and not have any consequences. And humans are nice and fun to be around, which is not what we want coyotes to feel. We want them to see humans and run the opposite way. So hazing them is super, super important. So there was a new um, study that came out recently as well that says um, coyotes learn to avoid behaviors that warrant hazing. So hazing does work and it's finally proven. It's very exciting. Um, and there are many different ways you can haze and many different tools that you can use for ultimately you are your best tool. Other things you can use include sticks and rocks, noisemakers like pots and pans, or coyote shaker cans. So if you look on off to the side over here, um, this is a coyote shaker can. It can be made super, super easily. I'm sure we all have some LaCroix cans hanging around, maybe some soda cans. Use one of those, rinse it out really well, throw in about 15 to 20 pennies and duct tape it shut. You could even get some of the pretty animal print duct tape, make it pretty for you. Um, and then you can shake that really loud at a coyote. You can also toss them in the direction of the coyote to try and scare them off. Really great resources and super cheap to make because you probably have most of the stuff laying around already. Hoses, again, are a great tool, just like the motion sensor sprinklers. Spraying water towards an animal is never a fun thing for that animal, and they're not going to want to be in the area anymore. And then high power flashlights work pretty well um, at night. We actually got that tip from someone down in Las Vegas who said that they would follow the coyote around with a high powered flashlight and they wouldn't want to be in the area anymore, which I don't know what kind of animal would. So how to how to haze. Um, if anyone's seen Bring It On, you want to use that chant as your mantra. You want to be aggressive, be e aggressive. You want to make yourself appear as large as you possibly can, yell, make a lot of noise, sound as forceful as you can, and get super mean. You do not want that coyote to feel comfortable around humans. So properly hazing them means being really, really mean. You can cuss at it, you can yell at it, anything you can do. You just want to be as mean as humanly possible. Um, and you want to make sure that you continue to haze that animal until it's completely gone from the area. You never want it to just stand there and look back and stay there. You want to continue to haze it. So coyotes really do belong in Nevada. Um, they do a lot of great stuff for us. Uh, and by removing attractants and hazing away coyotes, you're really helping them to learn how to be good neighbors to humans, um, as well as prevent conflict that might happen in your neighborhood. But really, this doesn't work unless it is an effort by everyone. So getting all of your neighbors on board, um, teaching them how to haze, giving them tools um, to help them to be better neighbors to the coyotes is going to be super important so that we can all kind of live together um, and help each other out. So one final thought for you. Um, first of all, thank you so much for attending. Here is my contact information, which you can feel free to shoot me over any comments, suggestions, questions. Um, if you want more resources, I'm happy to send you um, my kind of standard stuff that I send to everyone. And we really do appreciate you coming and staying home from for Nevada. Jess, were there any like big questions that we need to go over? Um, let's see, there is um, a couple questions I haven't gotten to yet. Um, so we have, um, what are uh, golf courses and other big community areas doing to mitigate coyotes? That would be up to whoever um, is kind of in charge of those places. I don't know if they have any standard ways of doing it, um, to be quite honest. Do you know of any, Jess? 
Um, so yeah, like you said, I, it's kind of up to each individual um, park, but for the most part, you know, wild spaces like golf courses um, are, are typical coyote habitat. So they are not necessarily um, removing the coyotes. They are just living in their natural habitat. Um, we also have another question of how do coyotes help us? Um, so kind of went over a little bit. So number one, they keep our ecosystems super, super healthy. They're going to keep all of the smaller animal um, populations in control. Um, I used kind of the example of the rabbits. I know rabbits tend to be a big problem for people, especially on lawns. They love that little grass. Um, so coyotes are going to prey on those rabbits and keep them at a more manageable level. Same with rodents that carry diseases. They definitely help to keep those populations down. Um, which is super, super important. And then also they are our natural little cleanup crew. So helping us with carry on and, and making sure that all of that is cleaned up is also one of their big jobs that they help us out with. Perfect. And then we also have a question about, are there koi wolves in Northern Nevada? Currently there is no evidence to, to suggest that there are koi wolves in Nevada. Um, Typically those occur more on the East Coast where they, and middle area of the, the country where there are populations of, of wolves. Perfect. And then should I worry about my kids playing in the desert and being attacked? Not really. Um, again, coyotes, very rare that they come into contact with humans. Um, and if you teach your kids how to properly haze away a coyote, they should be fine. I, if you have really little itty bitty kids, I wouldn't leave them alone just to hang out in the middle of the desert with no adult supervision. But if you have older kids and you teach them how to respect wildlife, how to get really big, loud and scary, um, I, I wouldn't be too concerned about them. Another great option for kids that I really like are air horns, because then they don't even really have to get that big and loud. They just have an air horn. They can, um, honk it at the coyote, and that typically is going to scare off any animal in the area. Awesome. And then uh, should we be concerned if we see a coyote during the day? No. So coyotes, um, like out in the middle of the desert, they are going to be more active during the day. Coyotes in general can be active during the day or, in, or at night. Um, so really seeing them during the day is just another part of, of what they're doing. But no cause for concern there. And uh, we'll take one last question. Um, are there any tracking programs for coyotes in Nevada? Currently, um, no. Coyotes are an unprotected species, so there aren't really any um, GPS collars that we put on them, um, at least from a state level. I track them whenever I get calls about coyotes, so I kind of have an idea of where they're hanging out in our urban areas. Um, but there isn't any actual study going on that I'm aware of. Perfect. All right. Um, and we have lots of thank yous. So Jess, um, are you going to be able to share your contact information so anyone can follow up with you if they have more questions after this great program? Yes, so my contact information is right down here. Um, you can call or email. Email is probably the best right now, um, but feel free to give me a call if, if you want to as well. Perfect. Well, thank you everyone so much for joining us. There are a few questions in the chat that I am still getting to uh, that I will send responses out for. Um, so let us know if anything else comes up. Awesome. Thank you all for hanging out with us today and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks everyone.